Welcome, everyone. I'm Dr. John White, Chief Medical Officer at WebMD. You know, we've been spending so much time talking about coronavirus over the past year, and that's important because it has led to a significant number of deaths. But you know what else has led to a significant number of deaths? Heart disease. It remains the number one cause of death. So today, I want to talk about some advancements, some new strategies that we're trying to implement in addressing heart disease and heart failure. So I've asked two experts and two friends. Nancy Brown, she is the CEO of the American Heart Association, and Tom Kutsampas. He is the president of the National Partnership for Healthcare and Hospice Innovation. Thanks for joining me. It's nice to see you, even if it's virtual. So. Hey, John, so good to thank see you. you. Thank yeah. you for having us. Yeah, thank you, John, so much. We're so grateful. You know, Nancy, I want to start off with what we've heard over the past year is the impact of COVID on heart disease, not just perhaps its impact on the structure and functioning of the heart, but the fact that, you know, we told people not to come in early on during the pandemic. And even though some people might have had chest pain or might have had, you know, atypical symptoms of heart attacks, we have to recognize that it has had a tremendous role in terms of how heart disease has impacted Americans last year. What's your perspective on the role of COVID and heart disease? The role of COVID and heart disease is very significant. I would uh, probably put it in two buckets. We know, for example, that individuals who have the risk factors for heart disease, hypertension, obesity, type 2 diabetes, um, are more likely to um, have severe complications if they get the, um, the uh, coronavirus, more likely to be hospitalized, and outcomes are worse. We have documented this in the American Heart Association's COVID-19 registry, uh, which we stood up last April, and we have now over 140,000 days of serial labs of hospitalized patients, and we have a number of scientific publications that are demonstrating these points about the risk factors of heart disease. We're seeing for the long haulers, of course, um, long-term effects of cardiovascular disease broadly. We are hearing a lot about blood clotting that is appearing in younger people months after they've recovered from the virus. And these are issues we are concerned about and we're tracking. And then of course, John, to the point that you raised, during the heat of the pandemic, especially individuals were not seeking care if they had the warning signs of a heart attack and of a stroke. And you know, care was down significantly last March, April, and May in uh, hospitals across the country. And we knew that heart attacks weren't down and strokes weren't down. And that's one reason that we launched a campaign at the American Heart Association called Don't Die of Doubt. Um, the goal of that campaign was to make sure that people understood that hospitals were still the safest place to be in a medical emergency and the importance of calling 911 at the first sign of a heart attack or a stroke. And sometimes, to be fair, that has been challenging messaging that patients might have only heard one message or, or got confused. You know, I mentioned at the beginning that you're both friends, and I didn't just invite you because, because you're friends. And I want to turn to you, Tom, because you and I have known each other in, in your you know, instrumental role in, in capital caring health but also with the, the partnership for innovation in, in terms of hospice care. So it, on the surface, it doesn't necessarily make sense, perhaps, that, hey, I'm talking about the American Heart Association. Don't people do pretty well nowadays with heart disease? And then I'm talking about hospice. So what made your two organizations come together to talk about how we address some issues of heart disease, particularly heart failure. Well, th and thank you again, John. You know, too many people die uh, alone in hospitals uh, with uh, heart disease, in-stage heart disease, and it really doesn't have to be that way. And uh, when we began talking with Nancy and her colleagues at the American Heart Association, we just had a wonderful discussion about how can we help Americans? How can we care for them 
make sure they know that care is available in their homes, that they can be supported in a, in a really comprehensive way and stay, stay at home during that process. And, and we decided that it was really important to create an advanced cardiac care handbook that would give them all of the information and the tools that would allow them to be able to recognize that they could stay home with the support of the care that we can deliver directly into the home. It's a wonderful option that too many people don't know about. And we wanted to make sure that people did know about it and knew about the availability of that care. Well, talk to us a little bit about that type of care because people may be watching and thinking, hey, if, if I have heart disease, I need to be treated at a hospital. And then let's be honest, no one wants to be in the hospital. We're not talking about symptoms of a heart attack. They need to go in to the hospital. We're talking about people with longer standing heart disease, heart failure, has COVID changed our thinking about what we can accomplish in the home? Oh, there's no question. Uh, it's really opened up the entire dialogue and discussion about what can be delivered in the home. And, you know, we can deliver uh, through our programs, our not-for-profit community-based programs throughout the nation. We can deliver a comprehensive set of services to support patients with heart disease in their home and support their families. You know, we've taken this idea of team-based comprehensive care uh, and, and delivering it right to the home directly to patients and families in the home. And it really eliminates the need for them to be going out uh, to the hospital or to uh, offices outside, particularly during these times like COVID where people are reticent to leave at all. So, you know, one of the challenges that Nancy mentioned was people weren't getting care during this period. Well, we can absolutely uh, deliver care in the home during this time and, and beyond, so people don't have to worry about that. And it really is extraordinarily important. You know, Nancy, I, I want to ask you about the fact, you know, the Thomas mentioned that many people didn't get care. Let's be honest. The majority of those persons in many ways are people of color that are disproportionately impacted by heart disease, disproportionately impacted by COVID, when we talk about lack of awareness in terms of therapy in the home, we know that people of color, brown and black persons, often aren't familiar with it. How do we help raise that awareness? You've been so good in raising awareness of symptoms of chest pain, including atypical symptoms of chest pain in women. How do we transport those lessons learned into a new strategy of helping everyone know about the awareness of these services that are available at home, particularly for minorities? Well, John, it's such an important question. And you know, there's no doubt that disparities exist at every stage of care. And through our partnership, uh, Tom and I and our teams are determined to provide information to make quality cardiovascular care available at each stage of life. Um, as an example, you know, only 50% of heart failure patients who would qualify for in-home hospice care are enrolled and among individuals of color, it's a much lower percentage. And so we know we have a big job to do to make sure that people are aware of these services and to make sure that individuals are in a healthcare system to begin with. Um, and you're exactly right, the need for education and awareness and um, you know, just for all of us, you know, someone to help us, uh, to help shepherd our care is very, very important. And this is a major fundamental priority that Tom and I share. Absolutely. It really is one of the most important things that we are taking on with this initiative. Well, I wanna ask you, Tom, about you know, some misunderstandings. So people could be listening and saying, I thought people were living longer with heart disease right now, doing better. You're telling me about hospice. And when I hear hospice, I think I don't have long to live. Help us understand who could be eligible for these services. We have hospice, but also we call it advanced illness care. We really incorporate a team-based approach that's comprehensive in, in the way it approaches the care delivery, but it really isn't limited to uh, the um, very end of life. We can care for people in their homes for a much longer period of time 
we, we absolutely uh, go in and put the team in place to support the patient and family throughout this period with advanced illness, if they have advanced illness. Uh, in-stage hospice is uh, at the very end, but we use the same model for providing advanced illness care. And that's really what's important about this is that it's not just the last six months of life or the last three months of life. It's really the last period of life that we can provide the uh, comprehensive support needed to make sure that they're able to stay in their homes. You know, we just uh, ta told a story recently about a wonderful couple in Washington. In fact, uh, the husband is 94. He helped start the Peace Corps. Uh, just an extraordinary person, uh, extraordinary uh, accomplished uh, person. And his wife said, you know, we have been in our home 60 years and he has advanced cardiac disease. And she said, we've been struggling about what to do. We didn't wanna leave. We didn't wanna to go to any sort of facility, but we thought it was, there was no option until they discovered the kind of care that we can bring into the home to support them. And the story is touching because it really shows that when we come in with our care, with our advanced illness care and support, not just the patient, but the family, the wife, a comprehensive uh, support that they could stay at home and live those uh, last years of life with that kind of care in their home. It's an extraordinary story, but it doesn't, it's not something that uh, needs to be unusual. We, we do this throughout the nation, the providers that are part of NPHI uh, throughout the communities in the United States, they provide this care and it's available, it's available now. And, and through working with Nancy and the American Heart Association, you know, our desire is to get the word out, uh, particularly as we've gone through COVID and people are nervous about getting out. Don't be, we'll, we can come into your home and we can care for you there. And it's not just about length of life. We kind of have focused on that, but it goes to your point, doesn't it? It's about quality of life as well. And, and that's yeah. a measure we haven't always focused on. It really is about quality of life. How do we make sure that the last years of your life, whether you're uh, at, uh, when you're at home suffering with advanced cardiac disease, for instance, uh, we can be there to support you, to support you not just clinically, but with social determinant support and make sure that you can remain in your home, age in place and get the right kind of care that allows you to do that. Think about how powerful that is. My mother and father both passed away from heart disease and they did not have the option of having someone come in their home and care for them the way that we're now doing it. And when I look back on sort of how they went through this, you know, I often think, gosh, if they had only had this option, it would have been extraordinarily important to support them in their home. Nancy, I have to ask you, you know, how has COVID impacted what the Heart Association does? And when we talk about awareness, how do you raise awareness of this kind of benefit and service at a time when you're not being able to have the, the big walks, the big galas, I talked to you several months ago. You and I have the same background. We might, we, might not, we might not have moved much. So how much more difficult is it for you now to, to raise awareness when do you have different tools in your toolbox now, the same number of tools? How has the COVID pandemic changed the way you do your advocacy? You know, it's such an important question, and I'm really proud, you know, that for decades, the American Heart Association has really focused on what I always call our three, you know, the three core pillars of our work, our brand, uh, so positively recognized and trusted by the American public, our science, you know, the 40,000 science volunteers of the AHA, and our grassroots, millions of volunteers and communities. And you're absolutely right, John, although we couldn't gather people together face to face, what we have seen is that suddenly health is at the top of everyone's agenda. You know, people who maybe didn't worry about being healthy or worry about, um, you know, the importance of 
uh, physical health and mental health and well-being now are quite concerned about this. So it's been an important moment for us to ramp up our digital content and, and ways that we can connect with people virtually, which we have done very successfully. And, you know, to partner, you know, this partnership that Tom and I are speaking about today is an example. The partnerships that we have with so many organizations at the state, community, and federal level have all allowed the AHA to continue our work. And I would say um, our work has never been more important. And truly, our organization was made for this moment of um, needing to be there for people with solutions that are based in science, that are delivered in communities as well as, um, as, well as globally. With these type of partnerships, the focus on care in the home, the focus of heart failure, would it have happened without this pandemic, Nancy? You know, I, I would say yes, it would have. The pandemic certainly has raised awareness of the importance of meeting people where they are and providing tools and solutions for people to access healthcare at home. And, um, you know, as John, as you and I have talked in the past, this is a trend that we're quite excited about at the AHA broadly. Um, and I think as it relates to helping people um, who are dealing with complex health issues like heart failure, as an example, we have long been committed to create a portfolio of solutions. And so before the pandemic even started, Tom and I were talking about how we could work together to support patients with heart failure, patients who've had a stroke, you know, individuals who have complex healthcare conditions um, that are taxing for the patient and for the caregiver. And but would so it have been I five years from now, just to push it? To be honest, uh, you know what? It been it, it, several years. I think on this particular initiative, I think it is, you know, it probably the pandemic timing didn't change it one way or the other. But I will tell you for other strategies at the AHA, we have accelerated, you know, how we're thinking about embedding our science based content into, you know, solutions that providers are using to connect with patients at home. That part of our work has absolutely accelerated. And then, Tom. What's been some of the challenges or frustrations? Because you really have to reach really three audiences in some ways. You have to reach patients, you have to reach caregivers in many ways, and you have to reach clinicians, all of whom can say, that's not the way we do this, right? We come into the home, we don't really do that. Yeah. Um, it's a mindset change, isn't it? How challenging has yeah. that been? And again, has COVID in some ways made it easier because there weren't a lot of options? COVID has certainly um, highlighted the issue of, and the need to go into the home. But as Nancy said, we've been talking about this for, for quite a while and we've been really excited about introducing the Advanced Cardiac Care Handbook. So this has been front and center for us. And I think the COVID issue has certainly uh, highlighted the need but our focus on getting this done and getting the information out there uh, has really uh, never, never waned or never increased. It's always been a for, on the forefront of, of our goal and objective to get the word out. You know, we've created this uh, with the American Heart Association, this extraordinary handbook called the Advanced Cardiac Care Handbook. And I think, John, it does exactly what you just asked me about. It addresses the needs and concerns for the patient, for the family, and for the clinician, it's comprehensive. It really is an extraordinary tool that gives the right information, the important information for each of those audiences to be comfortable with the availability of, uh, of good care that's deliverable in the home. And so we've been working together to get that word out, to get everyone to uh, be able to get a copy of the handbook, to see it, and to really understand after looking at it, uh, that all of this care is available and that, uh, um, that it's something, something that we believe will make an extraordinary difference in the way that people are cared for. Well, I'm going to help you both get this handbook out. So I we'll have an image of it on screen and tell viewers how they can get a copy of the handbook. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you can go to hospiceinnovations.org uh, or you can call 844-438- Six seven four four, and uh, you call that number, and we'll send you a copy of it uh, right away. 
Um, I, we, we believe that, and we are so excited because of the difference this will make in the lives of people. And I, I just can't tell you how extraordinary the American Heart Association is, the opportunity that we've had at the National Partnership for Healthcare and Hospice Innovation to work together. We're gonna to make a difference in the lives of these people throughout the nation. And uh, to me, uh, that, that goal and that mission is uh, heartwarming. Nancy, what does heart disease look like in five years? You know, um, heart disease hopefully will continue to have, um, you know, amazing innovations to allow people to live healthier lives if they are diagnosed with heart disease. And the American Heart Association is very committed to address issues of healthcare equity and access to healthcare for all. And we certainly hope that in the next five years, we will see a more equitable approach to delivering care and to uh, assuring that all people have an equal opportunity for health and well being, especially as it relates to the number one killer of Americans, heart disease. I wanna thank you both for sharing what you're doing, raising awareness of heart disease, heart failure, the options that are available in, in getting care at home, the role of, of hospice and other resources. Truly, thank you both for, for what you're doing. John, thank you for the opportunity to visit with you today. It's always a delight to spend time together. Yeah, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Nancy. And thank you, John. I mean, this is a tremendous discussion and uh, we are so grateful for the opportunity to have it with you and to get the word out of this important tool that will help uh, thousands and thousands of Americans throughout the nation. And thank you all for watching. If you have questions about today's broadcast, please feel free to drop me a line. You can email me at drjohn at webmd.net or post on our social properties, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thanks for watching.